Our next guest is one of the richest and most generous men in the world. Please welcome Bill Gates. Hi, Bill. Hi. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for doing this. And uh, how is the family? How are you? Well, I think everybody's lives have been completely upended uh, by this uh, social isolation that we're doing uh, to, you know, get get the disease numbers way, way down. So it's disconcerting. Uh, you know, a lot of online school, a lot of teams meetings, uh, a completely different routine. Yeah. So my question is, you warned everybody about this in a TED Talk in 2015. You predicted this would happen. Uh, and so I'm sure you're very prepared because you knew this was going to happen. Did you? Do you feel like you prepared for this? I mean, even though this probably surprised you beyond what you expected? Well, the goal of the uh, 2015 talk and the detailed uh, article in the New England Journal of Medicine was so that the government would do the work to be ready for the next epidemic. And that would have meant that we would have had diagnostics very quickly, uh, drugs very quickly, and even a vaccine, uh, all of those things dramatically faster than what we're going through here. Uh, over the last five years, the foundation and others uh, did make investments in things like a coalition called CEPI that will help get the vaccine out faster than would have otherwise been the case. But only about 5% of what should have been done uh, to get ready for this, because this is even you know, worse than war, and yet the amount that was put into it, the amount we practiced and had uh, you know, the ability to make these tools, uh, virtually nothing was done. And so are you saying, and I don't want to get political about this, obviously this administration is blaming the last administration saying they didn't have anything. Um, was, did anyone listen to you? Was there something? And then it was then uh, like, let the, then everybody abandoned it or what happened exactly? Well, it's hard to know how much to spend on something that you can't really compute the probability in any particular year that it's going to come, you know, fire, war, uh, earthquakes. Uh, and so government, you know, they look and they see we had epidemics like the Ebola epidemic in Africa that should have gotten us ready. Then we had Zika, uh, but a respiratory uh, pandemic uh, that's very widespread, uh, really we haven't seen uh, anything like this for the 100 years. And I actually thought that anniversary of 1918 would uh, you know, galvanize people as well. So a few things were done. Uh, some countries, even without that preparing in advance, have acted in a way that made sure that uh, very few of their citizens die and they don't have to shut down their economy. Uh, you know, now all the countries that have widespread infection, like the United States, we need to learn from each other about how you not only flatten the numbers, but to get them down. And then, you know, with luck uh, in early June, if the whole country does a better job of shutting down and we get uh, prioritization of the testing that's going on, what policies should we have? Because until we get almost everybody vaccinated uh, globally, we still won't be fully back to normal. Uh, we want to go you know, and manufacture and do construction and go to school. But there will be things like big public events where the risk will outweigh the risk of a disease rebound. So you just you just said June, but we aren't going to have vac any vaccines for probably a year. So how, I mean, I can't even imagine going out to a crowded restaurant or anything in June or July if we don't have vaccines? How how do you see us acclimating back into a normal life when we don't have the cure for this? Well, your point's a very good one, which is even if we're doing the right things where we've fixed the testing problems, uh, we're making sure people are strict about quarantine, we're doing really good contact tracing. And so the government is able to encourage some type of activities to resume. Even so, the populace has been thinking about this uh, infectious disease enough that people will be reluctant, even 
you know, they say, okay, it's fine to send your kids to school. I hope uh, we have enough proof that everybody will feel like they go along with that. Or if you want to reopen a factory, do enough work or show up that you can really engage in that activity. Some things like restaurants will probably have more spacing and the demand will be reduced because of what we've all gone through here. But we need to start getting things back to normal. They won't be back to normal until we either have that phenomenal vaccine or a therapeutic that's like over 95% effective. And so we have to assume that's gonna be almost 18 months from now. But, but I, I mean, you and Melinda, first of all, that's why I call you the most generous and I should include Melinda in this too. You're both extremely yep. generous. Mm -hmm. you, you donated a hundred million dollars um, to fight this as soon as this started in February, I think you, you donated the, the money. So that hundred million is going to go towards obviously trying to find a vaccine, but also this therapeutic that you're talking about that will be like a, a temporary fix. That's right. The foundation uh, does far more in terms of infectious disease work than any uh, group in the world. And so we've reprioritized and everybody uh, in all our grantees now prioritize this coronavirus work. So, you know, even polio eradication, we're not able to work on that or new drugs for HIV, but that skill set is very applicable to helping pick which drugs should go into trials and which vaccines we should build factories for uh, so that if one proves safe and efficacious, we can make billions of doses. So our whole thing is upended. We're giving money to up the testing capacity uh, because in developing countries where they can't do these quarantines, uh, that's where, sadly, uh, the vast majority of the deaths are likely to take place. Yeah. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back after this. So if I, I still don't, I mean, I, I can't wrap my head around if we don't really have a cure for it. Like, you know, I'm obviously, I'm doing my, my show from my, my house mm -hmm. and as a lot of other people, you know, that, that have shows are able to do, but I can't imagine having an audience all kind of sitting next to each other and that being, because because also, isn't it possible that it comes back in the fall? Well, we don't know how seasonal it is. So that would actually be good news that that is that if the force of infection went down in the summer, uh, that would make this thing of getting the case numbers way down. Uh, so we start opening up, that would actually make it easier, but you're right, then we'd have to pay attention to it coming back. But there are ways of doing that, that China is showing, South Korea is showing, that uh, the risk of infection is very, very low. So you might be back in your studio because the way the workers engage with each other and the amount they can be tested to make sure nobody's infectious will be very different than what we have today. You may or may not have the audience. I, I would guess that will take a lot longer than going back to the studio for the filming itself. You know, speaking of that, I mean, there's no cars on the road, very few planes. I mean, it's obviously affecting the economy in a bad way, but the planet is benefiting from this. And I know that's been important, the environmental issue for you. I mean, we have, they just said the air in Los Angeles is cleaner than it's ever been in the history of, I, I mean, ever. That's amazing. Yeah, I wish that all our jobs could be done uh, from home as well as your job and my job, you know, but for people who uh, are in restaurants or factories or construction or cleaning, uh, you know, they're looking at their livelihood going away. And so sadly, like many bad things, those who are in the toughest circumstances are going to bear most of the pain. And so we really, we want to get into this semi-normal phase as soon as we can. And then uh, the vaccine is the thing that, that will change things. And that's why, you know, really figuring out how do we make sure it's safe because uh, that when you give it to 7 billion healthy people, that's super important. So the challenge we put to scientists at the foundation and many, many places who are working night and day on this is very high. And, you know, although the best case is actually shorter than 18 months, we don't want to create a lot of expectations because we really aren't quite sure. So people like Fauci and myself are giving that as kind of the likely date. It could be better. It could be worse. So 
18 months and the economy is already, as you mentioned, I mean, all the it's it's heartbreaking what's happening to, to people out there that that were already living paycheck to paycheck and now don't know when they're going to get paid again. And, uh, you know, it's a strain on on, you know, unemployment. Everybody's everyone's you know, it's an issue for everyone. So how does the economy bounce back from something like this? Do you do you have faith that it will or how long do you think it's going to take? Well, I it won't go back to normal in some very rapid fashion because not only do we have, you know, these factories shut down uh, and all these activities have ceased, even, even as we start them back up, people will still be a bit leery about going out uh, and they will have seen their investments and their job security greatly reduced. So uh, the ebb, the the strong economy we had will take several years before that comes back. The good thing about the economy is that eventually it will come back. The medical price uh, that will be paid by countries all over the world, you know, that's a lot of deaths that uh, we'll simply never be able to reverse that at all. Um, and here's a question that I don't know if you can answer, but, uh, you know, I was talking to Pink who, of course, uh, had uh, COVID-19 and her, her three-year-old baby, who is now two days uh, fever-free, so he's getting better, and she's feeling much better. But she's super healthy, and and yet she gets it. And, you know, in the beginning, it was, uh, you know, only older people that, that were vulnerable or people with pre-existing conditions. And, and then it's, you know, babies and people that are healthy, and then you know, she gets it and she's in the same house with her husband and her daughter, they don't get it. And so how is it so, and, and she never had fever. She didn't have the, the same symptoms that everybody, she never once had fever. So it's all over the place. How is this happening to really healthy people? Yeah, we have a, a surveillance network that we've started uh, here in Seattle. It will get expanded to other locations. We're helping other countries do the same thing to really understand what's going on with different age ranges and professions. You know, in some communities, uh, blacks are getting the disease, severe disease in higher percentages. Uh, that's not well understood. The, this is different than flu where young people do get the flu quite a bit, although they don't die of it. Here, uh, the level of infection in young people is quite a bit younger. The death rates are different than the infection rates. Those are even more tilted towards the elderly and comorbidities, except for some health workers who seem to get such a strong exposure uh, that that alone makes it potentially fatal for them. So, so this deep understanding of our, our young people, part of the infection chain, that'll help inform things like resuming school uh, because you know it'd be great uh, if the kids who you know, essentially lost three months of the school year, uh, if we can get them back uh, you know, and help them catch up. I have a little question, if I may ask. Please ask. Um, do you, can you get different doses of COVID? In other words, because you, you mentioned with people like healthcare workers getting a full dose as opposed to a micro dose, I guess. And do you think that's the reason that the disease is presenting symptoms in different ways? Yeah, the initial... Uh, exposure in the inoculum uh, will make a difference because it's a race between the virus duplicating itself and the immune system saying, okay, what is this? Is this something I should go and attack? And so like when a healthcare worker goes to intubate somebody, they can get quite a an exposure. One of the things our foundation has done, it used to be that when you would take a test, you had to have a healthcare worker do that and stick a swab up to the back of your throat. And that would expose the healthcare worker. They'd have to wear protective equipment. Now what we've shown is that if you just give the patient the swab and have them just put it up at the tip of their nose, that the accuracy is every bit as good as having that healthcare worker. And so it means that you don't need protective equipment. You can actually send a test to somebody's home. And this is just, we just commenced the FDA recently. And so this idea of a home test that even before you go to a medical center where you might infect people, so that's called the self-swab uh, and that's catch, catching on. But 
Yeah, the exposure level, we see this with uh, measles and other respiratory diseases that the degree of exposure uh, makes a big difference, which is why some young healthy doctors uh, stunningly got got sick very quickly and, and unfortunately died. Right, wow. Well, thanks again for everything All you're right. doing. You're a good guy. We'll be back. We're back with Bill Gates. So, so let's end on a on a positive note. Yeah. What what gives you hope, and what should we uh, look at uh, as as hopeful in this situation? Well, I I feel very confident that this time we won't ignore the potential for the next epidemic. That this is such a dramatic thing that. Uh, you know, has reshaped our lives and the economy and created so many tragedies, we will get ready. And the work we do there will have benefits to other uh, infectious diseases as well. I also think we have, you know, great examples of heroics where people are stepping up, where communities are coming together to solve uh, these problems. And so although it's, it's very bad news, you know, almost a kind of worst case scenario, the ingenuity of people, the compassion of people, you know, the amount they're giving of their time and uh, money. Uh, I think, you know, hopefully this will renew our sense that we're kind of in this together, uh, you know, in our communities and our country and in the world, because, you know, until we stop this disease everywhere, uh, we'll always be at risk of it, it coming back to the United States. Yeah, I, I agree with you with it. It's uh, giving all of us a sense of, uh, I mean, some some people have always had compassion, uh, but but I think a, a lot of people now are getting that. And um, one one last question, uh, what do you look forward to the most when when all this is over? What what do you miss and what you're going to what are you going to do first when this is over? Well, there are things that were high priorities like stopping HIV infection and getting polio eradicated that sadly, even though we're able to repurpose, you know, all that expertise uh, to go after this epidemic, those things, this is a, a big setback. So I'll be thrilled when the, you know, the other work can resume that we go back and say, okay, how much did polio spread back during this or how much were these discovery programs interrupted? Uh, you know, I, I, I think everybody's going to be super excited to, to have their worries of four months ago being the ones that are, are top of mind once again. Yep. Well, you're, you're a great guy, and say hello to Melinda, and thank you so much, and uh, I'll see you soon. All right. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Bill. To see what else Bill has to say, check out his blog, Gates Notes. Go to our website for more information. Hi, I'm Andy. Ellen asked me to remind you to subscribe to her channel so you can see more awesome videos, like videos of me getting scared or saying embarrassing things, like Ball Peen Hammer, and also some videos of Ellen and other celebrities, if you're into that sort of thing. Oh, God!